bringing the people behind our food to life. We're making red flannel hash today. Hash is such a wonderful foundation recipe to learn because it derives from using up leftovers. You can use, you can clean out your winter fridge basically by putting together a variety of roots, some meat, some potatoes that you've got laying around and turn it into an amazing breakfast, lunch, or dinner. So to get started, we are gonna cook some onions. Onions are the only thing going into this hash that aren't cooked yet. So let's get those going. Don't be too put off by the amount of fat that goes into this recipe. It's really needed to get that great crunch that sort of signifies a really delicious hash. Butter is great for its flavor. It's great. It'll add like a really lovely crunch to the outside of the hash when it's done, but it does tend to burn pretty easily. It has a very low smoking point. So in order to protect our butter, since this is going to cook for a while, I'm actually going to add a little bit of vegetable oil to it. And that just raises the smoking point. I use grapeseed oil. You can use really any kind of oil that you want. My pan was preheated, so the butter instantly melted. And I'm going to just jump right in with my onions here. I'm using a mix of red and yellow onion that have been small diced. Um, you can use any kind of onions that you like, whatever you have. Again, this just sort of follows with our theme. What do you have in your pantry? Do you have shallots? Shallots work. I had a lot of red onions, so I used some red onions, some cipollini. I like a lot of onions in a hash. I think it really gives it a sweet flavor to match with some of these other vegetables. I'm going to add just a little bit of salt at this point to the onions. This is going to help draw out some of the liquid in the onions, which is what we want. Now a red flannel hash is a corned beef hash often. You can make it without corned beef and all veggie if you prefer. Um, today we're going to put some corned beef in it, but the flannel part comes from the beets. You can roast them if you like. If you're going to boil them, the nice thing about it is you don't have to pre-peel them, which can be very time consuming. Clean them up, like you know, rinse them under running water in case there's any dirt on it, but just throw them in a pot of water, boil them until they're tender, have a nice little disposable glove or um, like a, I have a set of uh, dishwashing, heavy duty dishwashing gloves that I use for food work. Um, put that on before you touch the beet because that actually is going to save your skin from a beautiful hue of pink that will come off. It does wash off, but it usually, you know, takes a few hours or a couple of showers. So um, to avoid that, I'm just putting on a glove and rubbing the beet. If I were using two gloves, I could use two hands, but I'm just gonna one glove it. And notice how the skin just rolls right off. And so this beet is ready to go. I've already diced my beets. I'm using both red and yellow beets today because I think they're beautiful. I guess my, uh, my flannel is plaid today. Um, but one of the key pieces for getting a really evenly cooked hash is to have all of the things that you cut up relatively the same size. So all of my diced vegetables, my potatoes, even my corned beef is all cut to about the same size. So this is an excellent uh, practice recipe for knife skills as well. What you're looking for with these onions is for them to release their liquid and to just slightly start to caramelize, just slightly start to get a little browning on them. They're going to cook the rest of the time with the hash, so they don't have to be completely cooked all the way tender. Now, there's still plenty of fat um, visible in with these onions from the butter that I put in. And that's a good thing, because I'm not going to add any more fat for a little while, and I am going to add my vegetables now. Uh, the first thing I'm going to add are my potatoes. These are red potatoes, the waxy kind. You can certainly make a hash with any kind of potato that you have. The red waxy potatoes tend to hold up a little bit better in terms of shape so that, you know, you can actually kind of see the dice when you're done. Um, but again, don't make a special trip if you've got the rest of potatoes or you've got leftover baked potatoes. Yukon Gold is a good choice for this. Um, and uh, keeping with the red flannel hash, if you have purple potatoes or red potatoes, they're a beautiful touch to this. So before I add any other vegetables, I'm making sure that my potatoes are coated with the, the fat and the onions. Now I cook the potatoes with a little bit of salt in the water, but potatoes are a salt suck. So I am at this point going to add a little bit of salt. You're gonna notice that as I make my hash, I season it at least with salt. 
at each level, that's building of flavors. And that way we don't have to worry about the potatoes sucking up all the salt that I put on later on down the road. Make sure you taste as you go. If you've cooked them with your corned beef, don't oversalt the hash. It's probably pretty salty already. I'm going to add my cabbage and my turnip now. Now, it is important as I go that I don't overdo how much I have in the pan. You want a pan with a lot of surface area because the, the crust is really what the hash is all about. You want to be able to incorporate all these different textures and flavors. But if I end up with a giant pan full of ingredients, I'm going to be in trouble um, because I will really won't get it cooked all the way through. Now I'm going to add what makes this the red flannel hash, the beets. Now, as I mentioned, beets will turn whatever they touch a beautiful shade of pink, and we want that in this recipe. So I'm gonna let the vegetable part cook right now. Uh, the vegetables themselves have a lot of liquid in them. We want that to steam out. Um, I'm going to just let it go and occasionally check underneath it um, to see if I've got any browning going on. You've heard the term slinging hash. Well, that is the, that's the actual technique of getting up under that hash and flipping it over so it gets brown on the bottom. That's when it helps to have a selection of tools handy. One tool that is very helpful is any kind of a wooden spoon that has a flat edge. Alternatively, any sort of a spatula with a flat edge because you're going to want to scrape off those great brown bits. Now, that is a good reminder that the pan that you're using to make hash in a needs to be scrapable, so nothing that is coated, no Teflon, no enamel uh, cast iron. You want to use a good cast iron pan or a good um, steel pan that has a solid bottom. Um, you really want to be able to conduct a lot of heat, so thick. So cast iron is generally your go-to for something like this. They have multiple sizes of cast iron, dep depending on how many people you're trying to feed, how much hash you're trying to make. So I'm just gonna let this go for a few minutes. Um, while it's cooking, I'll probably add a little spice action. Um, I'm keeping it kind of simple because I really want the vegetable flavor to come through, but I'm gonna add some pepper at this point. So based on my experience, I'm gonna check it and see what it looks like. Yeah, so I'm getting some good browning already just on the bottom of my vegetables. So now I'm going to go through and flip the whole thing over so that I've got whatever brown was created on the top now. And I'm going to give the bottom pieces a chance to, or the top pieces, or now the bottom pieces, will get a chance to brown. And my pink is starting to come out. Now notice I'm, I'm pressing down on this. I really want to get a good crust and so I am pushing hard onto the bottom of the pan. So I'm gonna flip it one more time before I add the meat. This pan is at about medium hot and being a cast iron pan, it's really gonna hold that heat. So if possible, leave it at medium all the way. Try not to turn it down. You really want that crust. Now if it starts to burn, by all means, turn it down a little bit, take it off the heat maybe for a second and add some of your cooking liquid and that'll keep it from getting too burned. A little bit of uh, burny crust is okay. So I've got a good flip on it now and I'm going to add some meat. And what I want to do is make sure that that meat gets onto the bottom of the pan where the crust action is happening. So here I go flipping again. Flip and press, flip and press. Now at this time, I'm going to add a little bit of liquid. I have beef stock. If you've got that cooking liquid from making corned beef, good stuff. The liquid's there to keep the hash from drying out. You want it to be moist on the inside. So we're trying to hit that beautiful balance between crispy and moist. Now a couple other things I'm going to add at this point for flavor because if I try and add it later when it's got a good crust going on, I'll be breaking up the crust in order to stir it. Um, the couple other things I want to add are a little bit of mustard. 
and some horseradish, some prepared horseradish. You can also use fresh horseradish. You can use any kind of mustard you have, whatever your favorite kind of mustard is. I like to use something pretty vinegary because it matches well with that corned beef flavor. I really want to rock that vinegar flavor, so I'm adding some hot sauce. It's a very vinegary hot sauce. But again, that's totally to taste. We like spicy food around my house, so you know you can use straight up vinegar. You know, the cider vinegar would be perfect in something like this. I'm gonna add a little bit more butter after I pat this down and just sort of let it melt and slowly seep through. So that guy will just melt. And then if I had a pan lid that fit not on top of the pan, but actually on the meat, you could use that. I've got another cast iron pan. So I am going to use that to add some extra weight and cook it faster. You don't have to do this step at all, but it adds, it just speeds up the crust timing. Um, now leave it alone. That's kind of the hard part, especially if you want to keep checking it. Leave it alone for 10 minutes or so. Okay, I've got some good crust happening. I'm happy. I am now going to do the last little bits that are gonna just take this home. So I'm gonna move my hash and get my egg going. Just a teeny bit of butter. So while my pan heats up for my egg, I'm gonna pop over real quick and just chiffonade these leaves. Uh, chiffonade is just to cut it into ribbons. So I'm just gonna stack my leaves roll them slightly to make them easier to hold on to and just cut thin strips. Now these will cook really quickly. I've got my preheated pan for my egg. I'm going to add my greens, but I'm going to put my fried egg right on the, the melted fat. Little bit of salt. I'm going to use a little red chili pepper on my egg and on my greens. I mentioned I like a little vinegar, I like a little heat, so I'm actually going to add a little whoops, hot sauce to help my uh, greens cook slightly. And while that's happening, I will sling my hash one last time. Oh yeah. Now don't let the dark color on the hash scare you. This isn't burnt, this is caramelized. Okay, now what I will do is leave the egg a little runny. Um, then it is almost like a sauce for the top of your hash. So what I'm looking for is just for the edges around the egg white to set. Any way you like your egg is just fine. While that egg finishes cooking, plate my beautiful hash. Yeah, nice runny egg, perfect. Top it. And then my beautiful beet greens. Ah, time to eat. But it's really about the social experience to me. Hatch capades are very, very simple in terms of the rules. Number one is to have fun. Number two is to order whatever you want. And number three is seed noodle number one.